Amen. Amen. Hey. My name is Ian. I'm the Family Life Pastor here at Epicenter Church. Pastor Mark has been preaching at a conference this weekend, and so I get the opportunity today to continue our series, Belong With You Guys. It's an opportunity that I don't uh, take lightly in any way, and it's something that I'm really excited to share with you this morning. Um, if you've been here for any of the previous three weeks of our series, Belong, you know that it's not just a typical series, but this is our theme for the year, 2019. Um, and, and there's a verse that's kind of centered, everything about Belong is centered around this verse. And it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. It's, it's the message version. And it says this. It says, that's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what he's building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. You can uh, sit down if you're not already. Most of y'all just bailed on me, bud. You're like, oh. So each of the past few weeks, Pastor Mark has been taking this passage in Ephesians chapter 2 and using it to, to um, kind of break down and explain to us what it means to belong to God, to belong to His kingdom and to belong to a church, what it means to, to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And, and I'd like to continue with that this morning. There's, there's a sentence in this passage that as I was reading it this week really just jumped out at me. And it's where Paul writes about God that he's using us all in what he's building, irrespective of how we got here. And that, that phrase, irrespective of how we got here, really exemplifies one of my favorite, probably my very favorite part of following Jesus. What to me is just the absolute best part of the gospel. And it's this, see, you came to the decision to follow Jesus differently than I did. Her life and her past is different from his life and, and his past. You come from here, but, but they come from, from over there. You're part of maybe this political party, and I'm part of that one. Or, or you used to do that, but, but I used to do this. She's good at this thing, but, but he's better at, at this other thing. I, I struggle with this, and maybe your struggles are somewhere, somewhere else. But, but the, the thing I love about Jesus is that no matter who you are, or what you look like, or where you come from, or what you've done, if you have made the decision to follow Jesus, you have as much right to the name Christian as anyone because God wants to use all of us, irrespective of how we got here, to build his kingdom. Your story is not any more or less valuable than my story, and my story is not any more or less usable by God than, than another person's story, no matter who we are, irrespective of how we got here. And the best news is that maybe you're here this morning and, and you have not yet made the decision to follow Jesus. There is still nothing about who you are or what you've done that could ever disqualify you from the opportunity to, to choose to become part of this kingdom family because irrespective of how you got here, you belong here. You just have to make the choice to put your faith in Him and make this your home. But if... All, if we are all part of the kingdom, that means that we are all have a responsibility in that kingdom. If God wants to use us all in what he is building, that means that we all have a part to play, a role to fill, or a mission to accomplish. But for many of us, despite Paul's reassurances that we all belong, that we are all equally important to this story, we often have, have a difficult time to see how the stones of our lives fit into what God is building, especially in comparison to those of others. We, we look at how God is using the people around us and we say, well, God could never use me that way. 
We, we, we look at all of the different ways that, that the people in our lives are being used by God to build his kingdom and we convince ourselves that, that our gifts, our situations, our past, our baggage, our weakness, and our stories could never be used in the same way. We, we begin to believe that we don't have anything to offer when it comes to being a part of what God is building because we don't see our abilities as being as significant as those around us. It reminds me of a time in middle school where I went to a, a basketball like tryout or, or practice or whatever it was, and, and I got there, and I began to look at all the other players, and this player over here was an excellent three-point shooter, and this player over here was a, was a great uh, ball handler, and then we had another player that was a terrific passer, and I began to feel incredibly insecure in my own abilities because I was like, I can't shoot like him, I can't dribble like him, I can't pass like her, I don't know if I'm going to fit in on this team, and then later on, a few weeks later, I realized that all of those same players had been looking at me and my height as a 5 foot 11 inch 12 year old. <laughs> it was about that awkward life, y'all, but anyway, they'd been looking at me and thinking the same thing about themselves. I don't know if I can you know, measure up to that person. And so instead of valuing the things that God has given to us, we compare ourselves with the gifts and abilities he's given to others, and it, it results in a large collection of us beginning to believe that we can't be used by God the way he wants to use us. So just as Paul said in Ephesians that God used the apostles as the foundation of what he's building. I want to use a passage from the life of some of the apostles as our foundation this morning to understanding that we all have something to offer when it comes to being used by God to build his kingdom. So look at Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, so it may be a little different from yours. Verse 1 says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. This, this phrase, looked at him intently. Your version may say, fixed their gaze upon him or looked directly at him. It gets translated in lots of different ways in lots of different versions of the Bible. But its, it, it's root is this Greek word that appears almost exclusively in books written by Luke the physician as the book of Acts was. But it basically means extreme focus or fixed attention. And I believe that the idea that Luke's trying to convey here is that this was not a quick nod or a passing glance in the direction of this lame man. It was an intentional look. He, he was looking directly at this man. Peter was telling him, I see you. You matter to me. You have my attention. See, on a busy day in a busy city, these two men are headed somewhere specific. They're going to three o'clock prayer. They have a schedule to keep, but they did not allow the busyness of their schedules to keep them from noticing the opportunity to be used by God to build his kingdom. They did not deem their plans more important than this man's problems. They stopped in their tracks and paid attention to him. I've heard from many people who convince themselves that they can't be part of what God is building because we're just too busy. We've got work or school or family or homework or sports. This kid has to be there for that game. We have to drop that kid over here for this rehearsal. And I can't miss this meeting. And you have to go to that event. And there's not even time in our schedules to go to church every week, let alone to be part of, to belong to something and to be used by God to build his kingdom. But the mistake that we make in this kind of thinking is the belief that, that being used by God is something we have to put on our calendar. Now look, there's a place for scheduled service. Don't, don't get me wrong. We, do we need more people to volunteer in our nurseries and in kids' ministry on Sunday mornings here at Epicenter? Yes. Are we desperate for people willing to invest in our student ministry and serve in our Wednesday night kids' discipleship programs? We absolutely are. Do we need more hosts and more ushers and more production team members? Of course we do. And to be honest, there are probably some of us here this morning who have time and opportunity to be involved in some of those things, 
but maybe there's something else that's been holding you back. And we'll, we'll cover some of that in a few verses. But for others of you, your schedule really is packed to the brim, and it would be unwise and unhealthy for you to take on another commitment right now. I understand that. But that does not mean that you can't be part of what God is building. In fact, it probably means that you are surrounded by more opportunities to be used by God. You just have to start paying attention. Let me explain it to you like this. My wife, Tiana, and I have been married for eight and a half years, and at least two or three times a month, a conversation happens in our house that goes something like this. My wife will come home on a Monday. It's usually a Monday. That's my day off. So she'll come home on a Monday, and she'll say, we'll, we'll be eating dinner, and she'll just kind of casually mention, hey, why didn't you load the dishwasher today while you were home? And I'll say, I didn't know it needed to be loaded. And she'll say, <clears throat> what do you mean you didn't need to know it needed to be loaded? The dishes have been in the sink since last night, and I know that there are at least six dishes that you put in there since this morning. What do you mean you didn't know it needed? Uh, and, and I'm like, I, I, I guess I just didn't see it. I'm sorry. She's like, okay, well, can you do it tonight, please? I'm like, yeah, as soon as, we, as soon as we finish dinner, I'll do it. And we'll go to bed. And it'll be, you know, 10 o'clock at night, and she'll, we'll be getting, getting ready to go to bed, and she'll look at me and say, hey, you, uh, you loaded the dishwasher, right? And I'm like, oops, I forgot. So like, well, how did you forget again? I just wasn't, I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry, I just got distracted, and then that's how I end up downstairs loading the dishwasher at 10.30 at night in my pajamas. But anyway, I, uh, I have some pretty extreme ADD, so, so you may not have as many of those kinds of situations as I do, but my point here remains. There's an old cliche that says, out of sight, out of mind, but I think a far more accurate rendering of that statement would be out of mind, out of sight. See, you've experienced this phenomenon too when you buy a new car or a new-to-you car, and you go and you buy this car, and you're like, this is a really nice car, and I haven't seen that many of these cars around town, so I'm going to stand out a little bit when I'm driving this thing. And so you get in your car, and you drive to work, and on the way to work, you literally pass seven million other versions of that same car. And you're like, where did all these cars come from? Did everybody buy this same car yesterday? It's been there the whole time. You just weren't looking for it. And so what I want you to understand this morning is that busy or not, we simply will not see opportunities to be used by God that we're not looking for. If we're not paying attention to the needs around us, we might walk by dozens of opportunities to change somebody's life every single day. A kind word here or an invitation to church there is all it takes to lead towards lasting life change for somebody. We just have to be looking for the opportunities. See, Peter and John didn't set out that day to do anything special or out of the ordinary. Their schedule didn't say 3 o'clock, go to prayer service, 3.15, interact with a man born lame. It wasn't part of their plan. But because they were paying attention to the opportunities that existed around them, they were ready and willing to act when the need presented itself. And they were able to be used by God to build His kingdom. In the same way, you and I are surrounded by opportunities on a daily basis to be used by God at work, at school, at the gym, while we're out to dinner, or even at our kids' soccer practices. We just have to start paying attention. Pastor Mark calls this being a, a there you are person, always being mindful of what's going on around us and opportunities for us to be used to build God's kingdom. And it's essential to life as a Christ follower. We have to pay attention. And that's what's, what, what, this, what happened when Peter looked at him intently. But maybe, maybe your schedule is not the thing that you feel disqualifies you from being fully used by God. Maybe you feel inadequate or unqualified, like you don't really have anything that he could use even if you wanted to be used. And if that's where you find yourself this morning, I can't wait for you to read the next couple verses. Let's look at verse 5. It says, The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. So talk about brutal honesty, right? Because this lame man is looking at them, expecting a gift, probably a generous gift, based on how intently they'd been looking at him, because any other reason would probably have just been creepy. But 
Peter looks at him and says, I don't have what you're looking for. I don't have silver or gold for you. But Peter didn't, although Peter didn't have what the man was looking for, he didn't allow that to stop him from engaging with the need and being used by God. See, too often we convince ourselves that we can't be part of what God is building because of what we do not have. We buy into the lie that we don't have the time, the talent, the expertise, or the experience to be used by God. We think that since we're not skilled in one area, that means that God can't use us in any area. Or since we don't have all the answers, that we can't give any insight or encouragement. Or because we struggle with this thing, that that God can't use us to make a difference in any other area of our lives. We focus far too much on our own deficiencies and not enough on God's sufficiency. We say that again. We focus far too much on our own deficiencies and nowhere near enough on God's sufficiency. We ignore the fact that Paul, that God told Paul that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. We forget about the verse that says my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And instead we sit there staring at all the things that we don't have. We tell ourselves we don't have what it takes to be used by God because we don't fit the mold that we've created in our head or because our past is too messed up or because we're socially awkward or because we tried that once seven years ago and it didn't work the way we thought it would or whatever other lie the enemy can get us to believe about ourselves to to get us to focus on what we don't have instead of who we have with us. Look at the second half of verse 6. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. When it comes to being used by God, I think those are some of the most powerful words we could ever say. Not get up and walk. Because that's a situational, circumstantial thing. There's power in those words. Don't get me wrong. We'll look at that in a minute. But would you would you go to somebody who's who's struggling with marriage difficulties and say, get up and walk? No, it's not applicable. It's but there's a universal statement that Peter says in this verse that applies to every opportunity that we have to be used by God. And it's this. But I'll give you what I have. I believe that God has given each of us in this room exactly what we need to help build his kingdom. Our passions, our interests, our personalities, our abilities, even our quirks have been placed there by design so that God can use each of us to carry out the good works he planned for us long ago. God doesn't demand that we show up to his kingdom as a master builder ready to help him lay the stones with precision and ease. Instead, he desires that we approach him as the willing servant ready to give him what we have in an effort to be used by him. And let him do the rest. So instead of saying, I don't have the ability to sing on the worship team, what if instead we said, I love babies, so I'll give you what I have and volunteer in the nursery? Instead of saying, I don't have the social skills to be outgoing enough to be a host, what if we said, I'll, I, I love technology, so I'll give you what I have and join the production team. I don't have the experience to be a life coach, but I'll know how to pray, so I'll give you what I have and be part of the prayer team. My budget is tight, and I don't have enough flexibility to give 10%, but I'll give you what I have, God, and start with 2%. I don't have the biblical knowledge to answer all the deep questions that my coworkers and classmates are asking me, but I'll give them what I have and tell them the story of how God has showed up in my own life. I don't have the medical training to cure your illness, but I'll give you what I have and pray that God will show up and do a miracle in your life. When we stop worrying about what we don't have and start looking for opportunities to give what we do have, I believe that we will be blown away by how much God can use us to change the lives of those around us. Even as we're still looking toward him to change us and make us more like him, 
We, we sometimes tell ourselves, hey, when I get it all together, then I'll, get in, then I'll let God use me. When I get it all figured out, then I'll help him build his kingdom. If, if having it all figured out is the prerequisite to being used by God, let's all just go home right now. Because nobody in this place is ever going to have it all figured out. So stop believing the lie that until you're good enough, God can't use you. All it takes to be used by God is the willingness to give what you have right now. To share your story, your talents, or your time to encourage and invest in others and be a light to the world. But with all that said, it's important to remember that we can't give what we don't have. Peter could never have said stand up and walk if he didn't already have the faith to believe that it would happen. He could not give the power of God if the power of God was not already evident in his life. In the same way, we cannot offer to others the love and grace and peace and strength and wisdom that comes from knowing Jesus if we're not immersing ourselves daily in a relationship with him. So if our goal is to be used by God to build his kingdom, then we should make it a priority to continually fill our lives with things we know we're going to need to give away. We need to do everything we can to constantly and consistently grow in our relationship with God so that we can be sure that we will have the level of faith, courage, and boldness to give what we have when an opportunity comes to our attention. But maybe you're here this morning and it's not busyness or a feeling of inadequacy that's driving you to feel like you don't belong, like you can't be used by God. Maybe you're here this morning and you find yourself in a situation or a circumstance that feels helpless or hopeless or even both. And if that's you, I want you to understand that this passage offers a template for you as well. But we're not going to find it in the perspective of Peter and John. See, up to this point, we've been looking just at the, at the, 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 the narrative solely from the Peter's perspective, from paying attention to the needs around us, not worrying about what we don't have, but, we will, but being willing to give what we have to be used by God. But I want to kind of pause right there at verse 6 and rewind a little bit and look again at this passage from the perspective of the man who was lame from birth. In verse 2, it says, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Talk about feeling helpless or hopeless. Not only can this man not walk, he cannot work to make his own living. He has to reply, rely on the kindness of others to even carry him to a gate every day so he can beg for strangers to give him enough to survive. Many theologians believe that this man has been begging at this same gate for decades at this point. And when we meet him in the story, he has no fantasies of ever being used by God. He's resigned to his fate and just hoping for survival. Many of us believe that we cannot be part of what God is building because we can't even keep our own lives put together. We've resigned ourselves to failure and we're simply hoping to survive. And it's worth noting that even in this lowly state, this lame man did not give up. He kept going to the gate. He kept asking for money. He kept hoping that something good would happen. And before we go any further, I just want to say, if you're here this morning and you're in a similarly dark or hopeless state, I want to commend you for not giving up. You're awake, you're alive, and you're trying. And for somebody in this room this morning, that's a victory. But I also want to let you know that I believe that you were created for more than that. Look at verse 5, which says, The lame man looked up at them eagerly, expecting some money. There's faith in this. It may not be as much or the same kind of faith as Peter had when he commanded this lame man one verse later to stand up and walk. But there is faith in this man eagerly expecting some money. He didn't have enough faith to expect healing, but he did have enough faith to expect something. If you find yourself in what feels like a hopeless situation, I would challenge you to remember that you made your way here this morning, which means you came expecting something. 
Maybe you just expected a break from the chaos of your life, or you expected just, a, just enough to re-energize and reinvigorate you to, to survive one more week, or maybe you came just so that your kids could go to E-Kids and learn about Jesus, but you showed up here today and you, with enough faith to expect something. Small faith is still faith, and small faith can lead to big things, but before we explore those big things. I want us to consider why the lame man's faith was so small. He was believing in this moment only, enough, only for enough money to support his current situation, and a change in circumstance wasn't even on his radar. He had probably given up on, that, on the dream of walking years ago and was merely hoping to make it to tomorrow. And some of us in this room this morning, somebody in this room this morning, you have allowed your dreams to die because they seem so far out of reach that they have become impossible. We've given up hope of being part of what God is building because because it feels like our reality is too much to overcome. You've stopped dreaming God-sized dreams because the weight of the world feels like it's crushing you and it's all you can do to just keep going, let alone accomplishing the goals that God dropped in your heart before life hit and everything changed. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God created you for more than just survival. His plans for you are bigger than merely scraping by. While it might feel like you're helpless or your situation is hopeless, something big is coming. You had enough faith to show up this morning expecting something, but I believe that God would ask you this morning to start expecting something bigger. Don't settle for expecting support for your current situation. Begin to believe in elevation to a new position. In the name of Jesus, tell that dream that you laid down long ago to get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, start believing again that your marriage can be restored. Stored. In the name of Jesus, start expecting that your sickness will be healed. In the name of Jesus, start believing that your addiction will be overcome. This is for somebody. In the name of Jesus, start believing that your child's future is so much brighter than the one the doctors have prescribed. You may not feel like you have much to give in this moment. But if you're willing to give what you have and put your faith in God to do the rest, you'll see things that you have never expected. Look at verse 7. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did it, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Up to this point, we've really been looking at this passage as two completely different narratives, the one of Peter and John and the one of the lame man. And this is where the two narratives fully and completely collide in this moment. This is the point in the story where both stories intersect, and this is a moment that requires faith and participation from both parties. Peter doesn't just say, get up and walk. He puts action to his faith by reaching down to help the lame man up. He shows that he belongs to Christ and allows God to use him in what he is building by paying attention to the need, ignoring what he does not have, and offering what he does have in an effort to help the lame man. But it's not enough for Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, Peter doesn't just say get up and walk and then go on about his day. There's a difference between seeing a need and saying, hey, I hope things work out for you. Hey, I acknowledge your need and I'll be praying for you. There's a difference between that and involving ourselves in the process to do something about that need. Peter put the full force of his faith into action by reaching down into the situation and saying, I don't just acknowledge your need. I don't just validify your feelings. I'm going to do something to help you out. Let me get involved. Adam, come on. It's not enough, though, for Peter to reach down and help the man up. The lame man has to believe that he is able to be helped. 
He too must put his faith in action. Adam got voluntold to help me out. Watch this. Just stay right there for a second. But this layman, we know that the, the medical problem was his feet and ankles were not strong enough to support his weight. And so even as he's looking expectantly at Peter, we're going to change your name to Peter for a minute, okay? Even as Peter has the faith to reach out and help this man up, watch what happens if this man's faith isn't there. Go. Some of you are here this morning, and you feel like you're in a hopeless and helpless situation. You've been stuck there for weeks or months or years, but God has sent people to help you. He's involved people in your life. People have reached into your situation and offered help. They've reached into your situation and done, done what they can to pull you up, but you don't believe that it can happen. It's not enough for somebody else to come and reach, reach out in faith into your situation. You have to you, I understand you can't walk alone. You can't walk on your own. The situation is too difficult for you to overcome by yourself. This lame man's feet and ankles were not strong enough to support him. But all he had to do was plant his feet. And instantly, thank you. Instantly, his feet and ankles were strengthened, and he jumped to his feet and began walking. This is a picture of how Jesus responds to our greatest needs. He doesn't just walk by and say, hey, you need to repent of your sins. He doesn't just walk by and say, hey, you need to approve your situation. He doesn't just walk by and say, hey, you need to get up. Once you get up, come and follow me. We'll hang out. No, no. He reaches down into our situation, but he also refuses to drag us kicking and screaming towards the plan that he has for our lives. He won't force us to walk and live in his love and redemption and restoration, but he offers it freely. He reaches down into our darkness, grabs hold of us, and helps us overcome. We have a part to play. We have to plant our feet in the belief that our situation can change, that we can be made new, that our healing, our miracle can happen. God will do the hard work, but we have to plant our feet in faith. In verse 8, it says that the formerly lame man jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Stand to your, stand to your feet this morning, if you will. This is the evidence that this man knew that he belonged because he instantly followed them into the temple. See, he had spent his entire life, 40 years, outside of that gate hoping that members of the crowd would give him enough, enough to survive. He was met with generosity, but he was also an outcast, an outsider, destined to live for, on the wrong side of the temple gates. But as soon as somebody demonstrated their own belonging to the kingdom by paying attention to his need and giving him what they had, he instantly realized that he had, as Paul put it, as much right to the name Christian as anybody. You belong here. God is using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what he is building. Your story matters just as much as mine. You came here from a different path, a different life's journey, but God can use you just as much as he can me. In verse 12, we see that a large crowd begins to surround Peter, John, and this lame man because they were astonished by what just happened. Again, this was a two-person miracle. Peter had to reach out in faith. He had to pay attention to the need. He had to ignore what he didn't have and give what he did have. But the lame man had to believe that he was redeemable, that, he, that his miracle could happen. He had to plant his feet. And because these two men realized that they indeed belonged to the kingdom of God, a huge crowd of people comes into Solomon's colonnade. And Peter, still paying attention and seeing another opportunity, he begins to preach to the crowd. 
He preaches for several verses throughout the rest of chapter 3. And in, verse, and in chapter 4, we learn that the religious leaders were not happy that Peter and John were doing miracles in the temple. But in verse 4 of chapter 4, it tells us that many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000, up from 3,000 just a couple chapters before. So what happened is that Peter was paying attention. He saw an opportunity to be used by God to give what he had to help build God's kingdom. This lame man gave what he had. It wasn't much, but he planted his feet in faith that God could do something in his life. And God used both of them from very different paths, from very different backgrounds, irrespective of how they got there. God used them. And on that day, 2,000 people put their faith in Jesus Christ. We belong here. You belong here. God is using us all, irrespective of how we got here. 